All right, well, uh, again, welcome to Amazing Grace. And if you've not had a chance yet to uh, fill out a Connect card, uh, please uh, get one of those on the way out the door, especially if you're new here. We would love to uh, get your information. We're going to have, we don't have it scheduled yet, but sometime soon we're going to have a pizza with the pastors. You can, uh, you know, hang out with the pastors and meet us and uh, we get to know you and that's good stuff, right? And uh, we're also getting ready to launch our life groups this fall. Um, there's going to be several uh, new life groups, and so there's going to be a lot of good stuff happening uh, here real soon. Uh, they're getting formed this month, and then next month, uh, about, about September, we'll start to advertise, and uh, you can sign up for those, and it's going to be a great, great fall here at Amazing Grace. All right, well, we are finishing up our series. Can you believe it? Uh, how, uh, Ten Commandments. How many weeks has that been? Hmm. Ten, yeah, yeah, you got it. And uh, so we are finishing that up. We, we started with the tenth one, and we've worked our way up to number one today. So today, we're going to look at the very first of the Ten Commandments. You know, one of the things that Christianity cannot be is moderately important. That was a quote from C.S. Lewis. And, and, and we keep the commandments of God. Why? That's our goal. Why? Uh, well, it's good for us. It's really healthy to live by the Ten Commandments. That, that's certainly true. It's a guideline for blessing for our lives. But we, we obey the commandments. We, we, at least we do our best because God gave us the commands. God is the one, our creator, our Lord, and we, want, we, we honor God. That's, that's our goal is to honor God because God is God. And, and I want to make sure that you understand this really clearly today is that you and I are not saved by keeping the commandments of God. Hallelujah. I mean, the law, right? The, there's no way that any of us can live up to all of these Ten Commandments perfectly. Uh, if you do, wow. I don't think so, right? All of us fall short of the standards that God has set. And, and in fact, here, here's what it says, to be sure... Uh, this is uh, Dallas Willard in his book, The Divine Conspiracy. Be sure, law is not the source of righteousness, but the course of righteousness. And, and so the law, it is not the source of righteousness. Your rightness before God, your standing, your right standing before God is made possible through the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross. And that's it. And, and so we are saved by grace through putting our trust, our faith in Jesus. And that is how you are saved. And, and so, uh, but this is the right way to live. And these are, these are ways that uh, as we become more and more like Jesus, we start seeing the fruit of God's Holy Spirit work in our lives. And there's this thing called sanctification. And God's Holy Spirit just continues to, to work in us and change us and transform us more and more like Jesus. So, uh, we've said it before, we're going to say it again, conviction, not condemnation. Will you say that with me? Conviction, not condemnation. I pray that this series has been very convicting to you, where you need to repent and you need to change. I pray that God's Holy Spirit will cause you to change. However, there is no condemnation in Jesus. No condemnation in Christ. You know, God uses people who have missed the mark incredibly. The Apostle Paul murdered. Peter denied Jesus. Thomas doubted. And that should be encouraging, that God uses people who miss the mark. And yet, we are blessed because of what Jesus has done. All right, so we're going to look at commandment number one. And as we do this, uh, we, we did this when we first started the series. I had you stand, and we read the commandments. I want to stand again. And, uh, and, and as, as you do that, we're going to do something we haven't done for a little while here at Amazing Grace either. And that is, I want you to just say hello to somebody. Just say, just turn to somebody and say, you're blessed. Just go ahead. You're blessed. You're blessed. Yes, you are. You are blessed. It's true. It's true. Awesome. All right. Very good. Okay, we're not going to read all the commandments. We're just going to read the first one. So here we go together. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt out of the land of slavery, you shall have no other gods before me. Please have a seat. Thank you very much. All right. So, you are to have no other gods before the true living God. 
There is to be no competition. This is a very exclusive relationship that God desires between you and him. You cannot bow down to God and also bow down to another little g God. You and I are called to worship the Lord our God with all of our hearts. And Micaiah did a great job last week talking about the little gods and kind of give them away. And again, they're not like golden calves anymore, but they're things like money, sex, power. Uh, they're idols that, that draw our attention, addictions. Uh, it can even be good things like sports. Uh, it can be another person. Uh, again, anything that competes or that takes a higher priority for you than your God can become an idol in your life. And so there is only one God, and we are to worship him above all. I saw a quote that says, the attraction of idols is not that we think they are gods, it is that they offer the possibility of making our own controllable God, and we can deal, that, that, one that we can deal with on our own terms. <laughs> now, that's interesting. In other words, uh, so you make a God, because, not because you think that thing's a God, but because now you can control your destiny by worshiping this God. Interesting thought. Like, okay, so if, again, a big one in any culture, money. If I make enough money, I don't have to worry about anything and I can control my own destiny. I can be my own God. Health, that can be something. If I, if I take care of my body well enough, I, I don't have to worry about being sick and I can control my future. Uh, maybe it's uh, enough influence in, in society. If I make the right political moves, if I uh, get enough power, then I can control my environment and I don't have to rely on God or anybody. See how insidious this can be? And, and so none of this is permitted in the Ten Commandments. And in fact, we see that God will have none of this. There is no other God, no other gods but him. And you are not to worship, you are not to ascribe worth, you are not to, to uh, have an ultimate concern other than God. Now we often start with verse three, you shall have no other gods before me, but we, we miss out on, on verse, the verses one and two, and, and, and I think verses one and two, they they. they answer a very critical question. And the question is, who? Who is this God that we worship? That's really important. And, and, and what we discover in verse 1 is God spoke these words. And God spoke these words. God is the God who speaks. He speaks. He communicates. He created with his words. Look at Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God speaks, and he says, let there be light, and there's light. And then he speaks, and, and, and there's this expanse between the waters below and the waters above, and there, the atmosphere is created. And then he speaks, and dry land appears, and then, and then vegetation begins to grow on, on that dry land. And, and God speaks, and there's a greater light and a lesser light, the sun, the moon, the stars, they, 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 they are visible. And, and he speaks, and, and, and there's the sky is filled with birds, and the water teems with living creature. And God speaks, and he says, let the land produce living creatures according to their own kind. And then finally, God speaks and he forms and he creates humankind, mankind. And so there's this mysterious and wonderful, powerful thing when God speaks. And, and God reveals himself. He reveals himself in his words. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but what if God, the creator, had not spoken. Can you imagine dealing with God who has never talked to us as people? Can you imagine that? Who had never said, hey, here's how to please me. Here's, here's, here, here are Ten Commandments that, that is the best way to live. What if God remained silent? You know, the only way to have a really good, good relationship is to talk to each other, right? I mean, if, you, if you've got a relationship with someone, you've got to communicate. That's just one of the one-on-one things of marriage and anything else. You know, when Kathy and I started dating, we, uh, we went out to coffee. And uh, I don't know if it was the caffeine or what, but we talked for six hours straight. I couldn't get her to shut up. She's not here today, so, you know, you, you, better, not, you better not tell her that I said that. But, you know, you know, it's like, I mean, 
you got to talk, right? And, 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 and here's what happens is when somebody speaks, they reveal their character. They reveal who they are. And this is God. He loves us. He graciously has spoken to us through the prophets, through his word, through he, he speaks to humanity. And, and, and God reveals himself to us. And, and we see that I am the Lord that's that word again, Yahweh. We talked about that when we were talking about the name of God. This is the covenant God. He is a personal God. He is I am. In other words, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is eternal, the eternal one. And this is the relationship that we have with God available to us because, and he reveals this to us because he speaks. He speaks. And, and, and so I am the Lord your God. I am this relational God. And, and here's a God who chooses. He chooses us. He chose you. He, he chose the nation of Israel above every other nation. He chose to have a special relationship with that nation. And now as an extension, we are now the people of God through Jesus. And so God speaks. He chooses us. He has called you and I, the children, the sons and daughters, the living God. That is who you are. And so that is, that is the relationship that we have with our God. And he is king. He's the king. And... and and, you know, if you know the, the history of Israel, they, at one point, they, they decided they'd, they'd never had a king, and then one day they decided that they wanted to have a king like every other nation. And so God permitted that, and he allowed them to have a king, and, and yet he never stopped being their king. And, and, and as we'll read here in just a little bit or talk about, uh, some of the kings were great kings. They were good. Some of them were evil. They were, they were really bad. So here's the problem. When you make a, a person a king other than your God, your king, you, you, it, it's, it's, a, it's a flip of the coin. You don't know what you're going to get. But God speaks. And one day, the king of kings and the Lord of lords is going to return. He's going to rule. He's going to reign. So verse 1, and God spoke these words. Exodus 20, verse 2. I am the Lord your God. I am Yahweh, I am the Lord. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And so we see who God is here as well, that he is our deliverer. He is your deliverer and my deliverer. He, 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 he delivers people from sin and from slavery. And the nation of Israel physically, they were slaves to Egypt. And, and in the same way, many of us here have been slaves to things in our lives and yet God has delivered you or you are in the process of being delivered from slavery from the idols that that has consumed your soul from these false gods that you would put your hope in and so all of us are on that journey of deliverance and uh, you know it, as soon as Adam and Eve uh, broke covenant in the garden uh, there was this amazing prophecy in, in Genesis chapter 3, um, they remember the, remember the story, right? Uh, Adam and Eve, they were told they just had one job. Okay, well, they worked the garden, but they had this one thing that they weren't supposed to do. Just one. Don't eat the forbidden fruit. Just don't do that. Everything's cool. Copacetic. Just don't do that one thing. And what do they do? Just like, you know, you tell your kids, don't. And what do they do? They do that one thing. And they ate the forbidden fruit. And so they are, they are being reprimanded, being cast out. And God's going through, you know, Adam and Eve. And then he gets to Satan. And, and here is what he says to the serpent, to Satan. He says, and I will put enmity. That, that word means friction, division, between you, Satan, and the woman, and between your offspring and, her, and, and hers. And that word also means seed, and he will crush your head. So the offspring of woman will crush your head. You will strike his heel. Most scholars believe that this is a reference to a prophecy of Jesus, the son of woman, of Mary, who came. And yes, Satan struck his heel. He had him on the cross. He had him down. But in that one act, Jesus crushes his head. 
And that is the good news of the gospel. And so God is our deliverer. God sends our deliverer, Jesus. We are delivered. We are delivered by the blood of Christ. And, and, and I love again what Micaiah said last week. He said, I'm not enough, but Jesus is. True? Any truer words ever been stated about our condition? I'm not enough, but Jesus is. And in the cross of Jesus, we are enough. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So who is God? He's creator, he's Lord, he's king, he's redeemer, he's our God. He's your God and my God. And this is why, this is why we, we desire to please him. We desire to do our very best to keep his commands, even when and even though we often fall short. All right, we're going to just look at one more passage of scripture, but we're going to kind of dig in here just a little bit for the rest of our time. So in Isaiah chapter 6, so again, if you have your Bible, I encourage you to turn with me. It's good to bring your Bible to church sometimes, you know, do it. Uh, bring your Bible app that's always on your phone. There's a great Bible app. If you don't know about it, just download it. It's called the Bible app. How about that? See, it's amazing. And you can see all the scripture there. It's, it's great stuff. But in Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah has this vision. And as we close our series through the Ten Commandments, as we're looking at this first commandment to, to uh, that, that you shall have no other gods besides the true living God, we, we get this vision, and, and, and Isaiah describes this vision that he has of God. And it begins this way. It says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord now, what year was this? About uh, 740, 739, somewhere in there. King Uzziah, uh, one of the, uh, he was the 10th king of Judah after the assassination of his father. Uh, yeah, there were good kings, there were bad kings. It was hard to be a king. Um, but Uzziah means Yahweh is my strength. See, he had this relationship with his God. Uh, the alternative is uh, Azariah. Yahweh has helped. And, and Uzziah, uh, under his reign, it was a, a, about a 52-year reign, and, and, and there was great prosperity and, and blessing in the nation of Judah during this time. Judah extends their borders. They regain the, the sea, Red Sea port of Eleth. Um, they successfully campaign against their enemies, um, the Philistines and Arabs and Ammonites, they, uh, they strengthen their fort fortifications in Jerusalem. Um, he commissions uh, men to put up, create this device that would shoot arrows over the, the, uh, the, the walls to protect uh, Jerusalem. He builds up the land. The, the Bible says he loved the soil. I like that because I, I come from a farming family. He loved the soil. And uh, they, they, th his enemies even paid tribute to him. I mean, it's, it, it was, was kind of almost a, a new glory day. But uh, during this time, there was stability. There was prosperity and blessing in Israel. And sadly, however, at the end of Uzziah's life, um, Uzziah sins against God, and he, he I guess, he, he gets proud, and so he goes into the temple, and he offers incense, and, and the priests there, there are about 80 priests, are saying, don't do this, king, this is not right, you have your place, uh, God has put us in, in a different place, and, and, uh, and then leprosy comes out uh, on his body, and he's never able to worship in the temple again. This is such kind of a sad story, but, but King Uzziah dies, and, 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 and I just want to, this little side sermon, I guess, to today, but, but leaders, um, people, those of you that lead in your families, those of you that lead in this community, um, your faithfulness matters, and, and your faithfulness matters to the church, it matters to our nation, it matters to your community, it matters to your family. You be a faithful leader, and even though you, King Uzziah was faithful much of his life, at the end he wasn't. So you stay faithful. You stay the course. Don't give up. Don't stop being faithful. You run this race well. Do it, do it, do it. It matters. But what do you do when your whole world starts to fall apart? And this is what was going on with the nation of Israel, because King Uzziah, who had brought this prosperity, that they had enjoyed this time and now their enemies were coming in. This was a crisis moment. 
for the nation. And Isaiah 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord. And then he gives this description. He says, here's the Lord. He's high and exalted. And he's seated on a throne. He's not standing there anxiously. He's not like, oh, what's going to happen? He's seated on his throne. He's reigning. He's high and exalted. And the train of his robe, okay, this train of his robe, you know what the train is, like, like the bride has the train. So it's this long piece. Uh, his train of his robe fills the temple. So it is a magnificent, magnificent vision. And then, and then above him, okay, above the Lord God, seated on this throne, in control of the world, even in the middle of the crisis that's going on all around, this God, above him were seraphim. Now, I've never met a seraphim, but ooh, I want to see one someday, I think. It's a, it, it could be a little frightening. But these seraphim, each with six wings, imagine this. And with two wings, they were covering their faces because they're in the presence of God. And, and with two wings, they covered their feet because, you know, who, who can walk in the presence of God? And with two wings, they're flying. So these magnificent creatures, these seraphim, they, 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 were, they were calling out to each other, the, the, the scripture says in verse 3. And, and, and now I, I can just, I don't know what, and, and I'm not going to, I'm not, if you're a tenor here today, I'm not knocking you, okay? But it's just like, I don't think it was up here they were saying these words. I just don't think so. And, and I'm going to tell you why in just a moment. But I think that, and I'm a baritone, I'm not a bass some of you are basses, you know, you're like, when you speak, like, it's there, right? I mean, it's like, there's presence there when you speak. And there was presence as these angels called, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And they just speak this back and forth. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And look at this. So there's this transcendence, and yet there's this imminence of God. See, the transcendent God who is holy, holy, and totally separate from us, and yet the imminence, the whole earth is filled with his glory. And at the sound of their voices, and this is why I think they're bass. You know, you've heard, some of you, you know, you know rock and roll. I mean, you know that good old, man, that pound, that beat, right? And it's like, when that's going on, man, it's shaken. The room is shaking. And here's what happened. It says, at the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the threshold shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. I mean, even, even the, the posts that are holding up everything's shaking because these magnificent creatures, seraphim, are proclaiming the holiness of God. The Shekinah glory was all around. And what's, 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 what's Isaiah's response to the presence and glimpsing the presence of God? Is he saying, oh, this is fantastic. Woo! man, I'm loving this. This is awesome. Is that his response? Woe is me. Uh-oh. I'm ruined. Why? Because I'm a sinful man. And I come from a group of people, a nation who's sinful. And my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. I'm in trouble. Woe is me. I'm ruined. For I'm a man of unclean lips and live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Isaiah knows how far short of the Ten Commandments that he, that he falls. He understands that there's no way that he can keep this law perfectly, that to, to be holy like God, to, to make it right, to be okay, to have this relationship with the great I Am. There's no way that he can do this. And, and, and as you and I, as I look around today, we understand we're in the same predicament that Isaiah was in. As we look around our, our lives, our nation, we understand the, the 
distance there is between who we are as a people and who God is. And that distance is great. And compared to the holiness of God, we are, we are soiled, we're dirty, we're not worthy. How can you and I ever be in the presence of God? How can our nation ever be blessed? How can we be blessed because of the sin that's around us? And we need to be reminded of what Isaiah is reminded of that day. Look at verse 6. He says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal. That's one of the hot coals from the altar that was burning at the altar in his hands, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. Even the seraphim could not touch this, 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 this coal. And with it, he touched my mouth, he said. And he says, see, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. What happens here is that Isaiah does nothing. Isaiah is there in his guilt, in his shame, in his distance from God. And yet this angel, by God's direction, takes the initiative to go to him and touch his lips and atone for his sin. His guilt is taken away. His sin atoned for. And in the days of Jesus, because of what Jesus Christ has done, we now have this grace as well. My dear children, John writes in 1 John chapter 2, I write this to you so that you will not sin. In other words, it's, it's, the very be- it's so much better for us when we live lives that are set apart for God and we don't sin. But But if anyone does sin, and we all do, we all fall short, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And he, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. And we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. See, as you know him, then it draws us more into wanting to please him and his Holy Spirit comes and works in us. And some of you are here today and you're saying, oh, you know, Pastor Tom, I could never be used by God because of my, my past, my sin. And, and I just want to tell you, know the grace of God. I, I, just, I just plead with you to accept this grace of God. You know, I ran across a, a, a quote about the law. And, and, and I want to kind of just give you a paraphrase of it. But um, it, it says this, A low view of the law always produces legalism. And a higher view of the law makes a person a seeker, seeker after God's grace. Now, what does that mean? It means that if you believe that, that God's commandments are something that he can, Oh, you know, I'm the Lord your God. Have no other gods before me. Don't commit adultery. Don't, don't, don't steal. Don't lie. Don't, you know, I mean, keep the Sabbath. Honor me. Don't take my name in vain. Uh, don't murder. But if every once in a while you kind of mess up, it's okay. No big deal. If that's how you look at the law, then yeah, you can keep it. You can, you can probably do that if, if it's no big deal. See, a, a low view of the law produces legalism because I think that I can keep enough boxes checked. And I, and I think that if I do, if I read the Bible enough, if I go to church, you know, hey, go to church. If I go to church every week, wouldn't it? If I go to church every week, right? If I go to Bible study, if I pray every day, if I, man, that, that I can do enough to please God. But see, that's a low view. It, it makes the bar achievable. And see, you've got to understand that God's holy. And he is so far above us. And his ways are so beyond our ways. And his perfection, the perfection that he demands, his holiness, it's so much more than we can, we, none of us here can achieve it. And so when you come to realize that, See, a high view of this law, you fall on the grace of God. And you realize there's no way that I can do it, and I need the grace of God. Hallelujah. And so, 
Here's what he goes on to say. The primary message of the Bible then is this. The lawmaker became the law keeper and died for me, the lawbreaker. That's well said. The lawmaker, the one who created this law, these standards that are so good for us that that if we'll live by them, we're going to have blessing in life. But God knew that we would never be able to keep all the commands perfectly, all of his law. And so the lawmaker comes into our world and he becomes the law keeper. Jesus Christ lived, died, and did not ever sin, not once. He was perfect in every way. And then he died. The Son of God died for you and me, the lawbreakers. And now we can have access and communion with God. It's by grace you're saved through faith. And so, what happens is a healthy fear. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And what our nation needs, what we need, church, is more fear of God. We need to live in a healthy fear of God. And that word is not um, pekad. It, it, it's, that's, the, that's the Hebrew word for terror. It, it's not, oh, 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 I'm terrified. No, no. The word is yura. It's being in awe of God. We need a healthy, yes, terror, but, but more so an awe of this holy God, a deep sense of reverence. We need to fear and awe God. And, the, and here's the thing. The fear of God, it's anyone who sees the hand of God in everything. You know, when you realize that there is never a time when God is not looking when God does not see, that you can't, I mean, God, we need an we need a understanding that God, God's hand, he is everywhere, and he's guiding our lives, and, and, and he's with us, and, and yeah, he's for us, but we need a healthy respect. We need to receive this grace. And so, there's a final part of this verse, after the atonement. In Isaiah, he writes this. This is what happened. Then I heard the voice of the Lord. (laughs) So no longer is this just the seraphim crying, holy, holy, holy. This is now the voice of the Lord. And this is the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? There's a reference to the Trinity, which we'll have a whole series on the Trinity, I think, someday. Yeah. And he said, here am I. Send me. Here am I, yeah, the man with unclean lips. Yeah, here am I, the guy who's part of a nation and a people of unclean lips, a sinful people, and yet here we are, available. Here I am. I'm available to your grace, God. I'm, I'm available to, to what you would do with my life as feeble and frail, and it's just me, but here I am. Use me for your glory. And see, and this is what God is calling to us, to his church. This is our next step as a congregation, as a people of God, is to say, here I am, use me. Here we are, God, use us. And, and let's listen to the voice of God. Whom shall I send? And then go. And it doesn't mean that you're perfect, but it means you plant some flags. You plant a flag in your home. You, you say, okay, this is going to be stake in the ground. We're going we're to have a godly home now. We're going to change some things. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to pray together. We're going to be godly people. We're going to change some of our habits. We're, we're, we're going to seek after God's heart. In my workplace, I, I'm going to make this a, a holy place. And, and instead of allowing my circumstances to frustrate me all the time, I'm, I'm going to see if I can be light and salt in my workplace and, and, and be a blessing to the people and be a witness, shine the light of Christ. To, to our neighbors, to my neighbors, to the people that I, that I play with, that, 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 that we can just, here I am, Lord, whatever you want to do, here I am, send me. You know, I, I want to thank you for your uh, gifts to the waves of mercy in Haiti and, and just uh, the blessing that is, and they're on their way, and, and uh, what, what a blessing, and thank you for, for saying, here, I, here we are. You know, one of our life groups this last Monday, Monday night, they went to City Center here in Columbus and just, uh, you know, down in Franklin's in one of the harder areas of our city and just serve kids food, you know. And I mean, just whatever it is, we can do these things. We're, we're looking at maybe tutoring again this fall, just, just getting, getting together and, and just, just getting into our community. And 
God, here we are. Rick Warren says, it's not about you. I love that line. It's not about you. Our lives are about the kingdom. And you and I, we get to be part of the kingdom. You do, we do. We get to be part of the kingdom work, man. This is the, this is the most awesome thing to get to be part of in the world. What God is doing. And so as we, as we mentor kids, as you're, you're involved in, their, in our teenagers' lives, as you're involved in, in our children's lives, ah, oh, we get to be part of the greatest work, the kingdom. Let's stand together. I want to invite you to pray with me. God, thank you for speaking these words. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And you shall have no other gods besides me, before me. Lord God, we are here. And Lord God, we want to say to you with the best that we have in our hearts, God, we, we, we want you to be our God. And we, Lord, so desperately want our lives to conform more and more to the image of your Son, to loving you as the Son loved the Father, as the Son loves the Father eternally. Lord, we want to be your children. And so, Lord, use us. Here we are. And Lord, help us to receive grace. That's where it starts. To have an understanding that that every one of us here needs your grace. And Lord, help us to just receive it and to receive this good news and that not to believe the lies of the enemy. The lie, will try, the lie of the enemy is that you are nobody, you are worthless, you're too sinful, you're too distant, you're too far away. And Lord God, I thank you so much that in Jesus you took the initiative. And just like that seraph that took that burning coal and cleansed Isaiah of his guilt and shame, that anyone here, all of us, this day, can be cleansed by you, not because of our works, but because of your gracious act toward us. So God, whatever it is you want to do, whatever calling that we need to respond to, whatever we need to hear today, whatever your Holy Spirit wants to do in these next moments, would you do that? Would you come and move? Would you be our God as we worship you and honor you? In the precious name we pray.